Again, welcome to Big Valley and welcome again over in the venue to all of you. Blessings and all of you watching online. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 16, okay? Turn to John chapter 16. If you're visiting and you don't own a Bible, when we're done here in just a little bit, you can go into the altar room right over here. There's an altar room over there in the venue, and we'll give you a Bible. We, we want to put the Word of God into your hands, and so uh, uh, let, us, uh, let us be a blessing to you, okay? Now, before I get into it, let me tell you about uh, something coming up this uh, Thursday. There's a benefit concert with J.J. Heller and Brandon Heath, and it's at the Gallo Center. Man, two great artists. It'd be a uh, a great night for you if you're married to go on a date with your spouse or if you're single, it'll be a great concert and it benefits uh, the Redwood Family Center, a great ministry in our community doing good things and uh, helping some ladies that are in a difficult spot. And so look, just go to the Gallo Arts uh, website, order some tickets and Thursday night go out and have a, a great time with your spouse if you're married. Uh, speaking of spouses, so last night we had a great event over in the venue, just all these couples, uh, that thing sells out all the time, and it was just, just really, really great. I talked with a number of uh, families that were there last night, and it was great. Talked to Lonnie uh, today, but Charlie, uh, rumble right back here. Uh, uh, my inbox was filled with a lot of complaints. Charlie was making the popcorn, and they said, man, the popcorn was horrible last night. <laughs> we gotta find somebody else who knows how to make popcorn so at the next event, Charlie, we can get you to do uh, something else. Okay, so if you're visiting with us, <laughs> if you're visiting with us, we're in a series where we're going through the uh, Gospel of John together, the Book of John uh, together. There, there are four Gospels that are written, okay? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Both uh, Matthew and Mark were written about 50 AD. That's about 17 years after the death and resurrection of, of, of Jesus, okay? So if Jesus dies when he's 33, Matthew and Mark written about 50 AD, they're about 17 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. The Gospel of Luke was written about 10 years after that. So the Gospel of Luke was actually written about 27 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then the Gospel of John, which is what we're going through, was written about 80 to 90 AD, which is about 47 years after the death and the burial uh, 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 and resurrection of, of Jesus. Now, those numbers, 17 years after you know, 27 years after Jesus goes to heaven, 47 years after Jesus goes to heaven, are gonna come in to play here in just a little bit. I wanted you to see that. John was actually a, a friend of Jesus. They hung out together. They did life together. They were, really, they were like best friends. I, I, I think that's safe to say. They would have had coffee together and lunch and breakfast and dinner together. So as we go through the Gospel of John, it's an eyewitness account to the life and the times and the ministry of, of Jesus. Um, all this to say we're, we're, we're going through the Gospel of John together as a, a church family. Okay, look, look at uh, chapter 16 and verse 5, okay? 16 verse 5. Jesus says, but now I am going away to the one who sent me, okay? I'm going away, he's telling his guides, he's telling his disciples, I'm going away to the one who sent me. And the one who sent him was the Father. And so obviously he's saying, I I'm gonna go back to glory, I'm gonna go back to heaven. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because what I've told you. You're bummed out because of what I just told you. And in chapter 15, he has just told them that because they have a relationship with him, that they were gonna be persecuted. He had just told his disciples that because they had a relationship with him, that the world was going to hate them. them. 
So he says, you grieve because of what I've just told you. Verse seven, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the helper, helper some of your Bibles say, won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And Jesus fulfilled this promise. After he had gone back to the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit to be with them. And you can read about this moment in Acts chapter two. In fact, in a little while, we're gonna, we're gonna read it together. Now in John chapter 14, Jesus talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. In fact, I did three messages on it. I talked about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I talked about the filling of the Holy Spirit, and I talked about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Spent a lot of time talking about those three aspects of the Holy Spirit, and now in chapter 16, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit again. In fact, let us, let us go back to John chapter 14. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you a, another advocate. He'll give you another helper, a comforter, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. And I want you to zero in on that last sentence, but you know him. How, how, how do we know him? If, if you gotta go back to the Father and then you'll send the advocate, how, how do we know him? Well, because he lives with you. Who's he talking about? He's talking about himself. And later, not only will he be with you, I mean, this is such an obvious uh, reference to the, the, the Trinity. He's with you right now, Jesus is saying. But later, he's not gonna be with you. He'll actually be in you. Okay, now, now I want you to hang on to that. You gotta remember that. Because we're gonna come back to that here in, in, in just a moment. So again, anyway, in chapter 14, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, and now, again, he's talking about the Holy Spirit in chapter 16, okay? Now, now Jesus goes on to say this about the Holy Spirit in chapter 16. Look, look at verse 12. He says, there's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of truth comes, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes, or the Advocate comes, or the Comforter comes, some of your Bibles use those words, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has learned, what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. I'm gonna stop here and I, I wanna make the first of, of two major points that I just wanna leave with you. Before you head back out to your cars and it's still raining like crazy out there, I wanna leave you with two major points that kind of you grab onto. And here's the first one, okay? The Holy Spirit is the believer's great teacher, okay? I want you to grab a hold of that. I want you to really understand this truth. Look, look at verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. You see, Jesus knew that the, the disciples were ignorant of the word. So he assures them that when the Holy Spirit came into their lives, that he would be their great teacher. I wanna take you back to chapter 14, where Jesus said this, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now you need to understand that this promise was made primarily to the apostles. He's not making this promise to you. When you read the scriptures, you always have to look at it in context, okay? And this promise here guarantees the accuracy of what, you know, all of these men wrote in the scriptures. 
Remember, everything that we're reading here in the Gospel of John was written 47 years after Jesus dies. How in the world did John remember all of these stories with such detail? How did he, how did he remember that? Man, I, I walk out of my house and 10 minutes later, I forget all kinds of things. Right, husbands? <laughs> How in the world did Matthew and Mark 17 years after the death and burial of Jesus remember what they wrote? Obviously, Luke wasn't around. He was gathering his information from others. But how did the people he was gathering the information from 27 years after the death and burial of Jesus remember? How, how in the world did John, 47 years later, remember the Holy Spirit? Jesus told the guys, hey, listen, there's coming a moment. I'm going to go to the Father, and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to be your great teacher. He'll be the one who will remind you of all of these moments that we've spent together on the shores of the Galilee, so to speak. He'll be the one who will do that. Now with that said, the Holy Spirit does some, something similar in our lives to, to today. The Holy Spirit brings to our minds the, the teachings of Scripture just when we need them. I'll bet we all have stories where, I don't know, we were going through a bummer, we were going through a horrible time, we were going through a depression, uh, something crummy happened to us, our spouse, our children, our parents, a friend in our small group. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, just a verse came to our mind. A scripture came to our mind that brought comfort. Who does that? How does that happen? The Holy Spirit does it. He's the one who brings to our minds, our remembrance, the scriptures. Oftentimes, I'll bet there isn't one message that, that I give here, you can ask any preacher this, or even your small group leader, this happens, or your Sunday school teacher, this happens all the time when I have notes but it could be from last night to today to the next hour, all of a sudden, I'm sharing a passage that I never even thought about. I didn't have it in my notes. I didn't say it last night, but I'm saying it this hour, and I, I may not even say it next hour. There may be some other verse. How does that happen? It's simply the Holy Spirit in me reminding me of passages that I've read or studied maybe a week ago, maybe a month ago, maybe a year ago, maybe a decade ago, maybe 47 years ago. This time of year, um, kids that are in school, they get super spiritual. They want everybody praying for them. You know why? Finals. Hey, can you pray for me? It's finals, okay. And I always tell my kids when they were going through school and those that are in school now, look, here's my prayer for you. My prayer for you is that God would bring back to your remembrance that which you have studied. <laughs> Isn't that the key? I mean, that's the key to the whole thing. I mean, what kids want is, hey, you know, Pastor, would you pray for me? I got finals coming up. Well, have you studied? No. I just want God to supernaturally fill my mind with, you know, A, B, C, D, whatever the number is, you know, so I can fill in there. No, that's not how it works. What you want is you want to study the material, and then, God, would you recall it to my mind as I look at the questions and whatever, write my answers? And the same thing is true for us. The Holy Spirit can't bring to our memory that which we haven't read, that which we haven't studied, that which we haven't meditated on or memorized, you see? 
That's why it's important to get up in the morning and read some scripture, spend some time in the word, study the word, whatever it might be. And you may think, what? What was that about? You may leave this message this morning and walk in your car and go, well, that was a dud. (laughs) Could be. And then next year, next decade, 47 years from now, I don't know, maybe you'll be talking to your grandkids and something will come to mind. The Holy Spirit, the great teacher, will bring it to your mind. You forgot it was there. You didn't even know it was there. And so there is application for us today. The application, though, is different. The apostles didn't have this. They didn't have any of this. We do. We have the the word of God with us. 1 John chapter 2 says, I am writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit, and he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true, for the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know, and what he teaches is true, and it's not a lie. Now, now this doesn't mean that we can't learn anything from those that have been taught the word by the Holy Spirit. Pastors or elders or teachers or your parents or your grandparents or a Sunday school teacher. That's not what, what John is saying here. If, if John had thought this, he would have never written this epistle to teach people. That was the point of this epistle. He was writing it to a group of people to teach them. That's not what he's saying here. In fact, I want you to write this down. The person who is the most fully taught of God is the very one who will be most ready to listen to what God has taught others. Isn't that good? I couldn't remember who I got that from. That's why I can't give you the name. I know it wasn't me, but I just forgot to write down who who I got that from. The person who is the most fully taught of God is the very one who will be the most ready to listen to what God has taught others others. So I don't want you to get the impression that, you know, teachers aren't necessary or preachers aren't necessary or Sunday school teachers aren't necessary or, you know, whatever. That's not the point of this. The point is, is that we have the Holy Spirit in us who is the great, he is the great teacher. Now let me come at this from the other side of the coin and this may help you a little bit. There's no way that a non-believer can truly understand the word of God. It's impossible. Why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit living in them. You see, the only way any of us can even begin to understand the word of God is through the great teacher, the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, he can't help you understand the, the word. I remember, and some of you might be able to remember back before you gave your life to Christ. I would go to churches, you know, and I'd hear like Bill Yeager, one of the great preachers on the planet, or, you know, Bill Nortel for over at, you know, Modesto Covenant, or whoever it was, and they'd be preaching their guts out, teaching the word, and it would just be like foreign language to me. It was like, what? It was just, it was goobly gock. It didn't mean anything to me. They were lies, they were fables. Really? We're learning from a book that's, you know, thousands of years old. It didn't make any sense to me. Literally, it made no sense. And the reason why was is because I just didn't know the Lord. I didn't have the Holy Spirit in me. But I can tell you this, I remember the day I gave my life to Christ. I remember all of a sudden I had the Holy Spirit in me and I didn't understand all the, all the, nomenclature. I didn't understand all the theological implications of it. I didn't know that the Holy Spirit was living in me, but I did know this. All of a sudden, the Bible began to make some sense. All of a sudden, there were verses I was reading, and and you know what? That makes some sense to me. You know, I think I get that. Hey, I, I understand. What changed? I had the great teacher living within me. Psalms 119 says this. Oh, how I love your instructions. See that right there? No unbeliever has ever said that. 
I think about them all day long. No unbeliever has ever said that. Your commands, they make me wiser than my enemies for they are my constant guide. No unbeliever has ever said that. Yes, I have more insight than my teachers for I am always thinking of your laws. No unbeliever has ever said that. I am, I'm even wiser than my elders for I have kept your commands. No unbeliever has ever said that. I refuse to walk on, on any evil path so that I may remain obedient to your word. No unbeliever has ever said that. I have turned away from your, I have not turned away from your regulations. Haven't done it, for you've taught me well. No unbeliever has ever said that. Beloved, unbelievers can't understand the word because they don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. They don't have the great teacher indwelling them. Here's, here's the bottom line, okay, to, to point one. God has gifted people to be teachers of his word. In other words, we can learn from gifted teachers. But no Christian is dependent on human teachers to learn the word because we as believers have a divine teacher the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord that you've had the opportunity in this culture with the internet and podcasts and books and radio ministries and all that. We've all been exposed to some of the finest teachers on the planet. Praise God for that. But you're not dependent upon those people. All you need is the scriptures, a willing heart, and the Holy Spirit in you. God can do amazing things just with that. I, I love what King David said in Psalm 143. He said, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on firm footing. You see, David knew that God himself was able to teach him. And oftentimes, God used teachers and and people in his life, in our lives, he uses teachers and pastors and preachers to accomplish this. But God doesn't need a pastor or a teacher in anybody because through the Holy Spirit, he can teach anybody. He can lead anybody if they're willing and they're humble be, be, before him. So number one, or the first major thing that I, I just wanted you to understand is this, is that the Holy Spirit is the believer's great teacher. But there's a second major point I wanna make, and that's this. The Holy Spirit is the believer's great encourager. And I don't know if encourager was the right word, man. I changed that word I don't know how many times, you know, and I finally just said, use it. But look at verse 16, okay, of John chapter 16. Jesus said, in a little while, you won't see me anymore, but a little while after that, you will see me again. <laughs> That's weird. It doesn't make any sense. Some of the disciples asked each other, what does he mean when he says, in a little while you won't see me, but then you will see me, and I'm going to the Father. What, 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 what does you know, he mean by a little while? We, we don't understand. And Jesus realized what they wanted and to ask him about, so he said, are you asking yourselves what I meant? I said in a little while you won't see me, but a little while after that you will see me again. Now I want you to know, this is super interesting. A lot of scholars don't agree, uh, agree on what's being said here, what Jesus is talking about, okay? I'm gonna give you the two major camps. First one is this. When Jesus said, hey, there's gonna be a little while here, you know, you see me now, but then you won't see me, but, but then you'll see me again. He was talking about the fact there was coming a moment, he was gonna die on a cross, and then we're gonna put him into a tomb. So you see me, now, now you don't see me. I'm in the tomb. He, he, life is over, right? And then three days later, you're gonna see me again. Woo! Wow! That's what a lot of scholars believe he was talking about. He was talking about the three days he was in the tomb. And then he walks out of the tomb, right? And then they all got to see him again. I don't think that's what he's talking about. Makes some sense, I get it. And maybe it does, maybe that's what he means, but I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think he had something else in mind. 
I think he's referring to the moment he would go back to heaven to be with the Father, the, the ascension. Obviously, when Jesus went back to the Father, they wouldn't see him. But then Jesus would send the Holy Spirit, which meant that they would see him. Remember what he said? I'm with you now, but I'll be in you later. Okay? Let me, let me keep unpacking this. You see, Jesus dwells in believers through the Holy Spirit, which means they would see Jesus again through the Holy Spirit. They would exchange physical sight for spiritual sight. In other words, today believers see Jesus through the Spirit's teaching of the Word of God, right? First Peter chapter 1 says, you love him even though you've never seen him. He wrote this 2,000 years ago to a group of people. It's been 2,000 years. I, I love him, and I've, I've never seen him. Either of you. Though you don't see him now, you trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Isn't that true? We've never seen him, and yet we, we rejoice, we trust him. How do we do that? Through this. We've read the scriptures. The Holy Spirit has enlightened us to truth. And so here we are. We're trusting in somebody we've never seen. We rejoice in our salvation that we've never even seen Jesus. We've simply experienced him, if I could use that word, through the Holy Spirit's enlightening of the word of God in our lives. 2 Corinthians Chapter five says, for we live by believing and not by seeing. Now look back at our, our text, John chapter 16. Look at verse 20. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn over what is gonna happen to me, but the world's gonna rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. It'll be like a woman suffering from the pains of labor, when her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has been brought a new baby into the world. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice, and nobody will be able to rob you of that joy. Beloved, the disciples were really bummed out that Jesus was going, going to leave them. But Jesus knew that once they saw him again through the coming of the Holy Spirit into their lives, that their sorrow would turn to joy. It would be joy from there on out. In fact, I want to take, you, take us all back to this moment. Remember, Jesus has died on a cross. He was in a tomb for three days, and he comes out of the grave, right? Right? And for about 40 days, he walks around Jerusalem. So John and the disciples would have seen him. They would have hung out together for 40 days. 40 days after he walks out of the tomb, he's running around Jerusalem. A lot of people saw Jesus after he was resurrected. Okay? It says this, Acts chapter 1. I remember after, after 40 days... He's going to be taken up to heaven. He's going to go back to the Father. I've been telling the guys this for a long time. Verse uh, 4 says, Once when he was eating with them, once when Jesus was eating with the disciples, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. That's the Holy Spirit. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles uh, were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has a time come for you to free Israel and restore the kingdom? And Jesus replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But, you do need to know this, guys. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Now, here it is. Here it is. Here's the moment. Ready? And after this, Jesus was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. 
So he comes out of the tomb. 40 days he's running around on planet Earth with the guys. And then he says, guys, listen, don't leave Jerusalem. I've been promising you the Holy Spirit. This is going to be a big moment. He's not just going to be with you. He's going to be in you. Okay, guys, and when he comes on you, you're going to have power like you never had before. And then he's gone. And for 10 days, about 10 days, they're just sitting around Jerusalem. There he was. Now he's gone. It's a bummer. How long do we got to sit around here and twiddle our thumbs? I don't know. He just said, stay here. Remember, they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. No, well, you know, what do you think? Give it another day? Yeah, give it another day, you know. I don't know. They're sitting around playing pinochle. I, I don't know what they were doing. But it had to be a bummer. He was there with them and now he's gone. And he says, guys, just hang out here. Just, just be patient. And so there they are, hanging out, just, just, just waiting. Then you get to Acts chapter two. And now the Holy Spirit's gonna come. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers are meeting together in one place. So they're all hanging out. Wonder how much longer it's going to be. Suddenly, something's going to happen. Something is going to change their lives and our lives forever. No longer is Jesus just going to be by us or next to us, he is now going to be in us. Here it is buckle your seatbelts. There was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house that they were all sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoke by these believers. They were completely amazed. How can they, how can this be? They exclaimed, these guys are like dumb guys from Modesto. <laughs> they don't have their PhD from Cal or UCLA or, or Harvard or Yale. These are guys from Galilee. They're fishermen. Yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Wow. This was an amazing moment in history. Jesus had, had promised his disciples that when he arrived in heaven that he would send the Holy Spirit to live within them forever. And now we have that moment in Acts chapter two. The disciples knew exactly what this meant. They knew that Jesus had arrived in heaven and had sent the Holy Spirit. And there's no doubt that they were encouraged and filled with joy. It literally changed their lives forever. They were now seeing Jesus through the Holy Spirit who was indwelling them. Let me, uh, let me give you four quick thoughts about how the Holy Spirit maybe encourages us today, and there's lots of reasons, but number one, the Holy Spirit encourages you by teaching you God's truth, and I already talked a lot about this. If, beloved, if, if you're not encouraged over the fact that you have the ability to understand the word of God, man, I don't know, something wrong. Something wrong. That's an encouraging thought. Man, I have the ability to understand God's word. I have a divine teacher within me. Are you taking advantage of that? Are you finding yourself in good you know, Bible studies, men's Bible studies, women's Bible studies. 
Man, have you made a commitment to being be in church each week? Man, are, are you taking advantage of this great, great truth? Number two, the Holy Spirit encourages you by giving you God's peace. In John 14, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I don't give you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. What a wonderful promise. God says, I'm gonna give you peace and that peace comes through the Holy Spirit indwelling you. And the peace that God gives us is way different than the peace that the world offers and the world does offer some peace. If you're really bummed and troubled and about something, now you get enough beers in you, that'll numb you out. I'll give you some peace for a while. Then you sober up and all that stuff is still there. There's a lot of ways that we as human beings try to find peace in this world through pornography, becoming workaholics. There's lots of ways that with the troubles of life that come, we, we, we try to you know, find some relief from all of the stuff. And Jesus said, look, when you have my Holy Spirit in you, there's a peace available to you that's like no other peace. Remember, he, he was known as the Prince of Peace. One of the names he gave himself in the Old Testament was uh, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of Peace. And he gave himself that name not to remind him of who he is. <laughs> he knows that. He gave himself that name to remind you. Hey, I'm the, I'm the Lord of I'm the Lord of peace. Number three, the Holy Spirit encourages you by filling you with God's love. In Romans chapter five, it says, God has poured out his love into our hearts. How did he do that? When the Holy Spirit came. He, he gave us the Holy Spirit, and at that moment, whew, God was saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. And they weren't just words to him. He demonstrated his love towards you in that while you were but a sinner. He died on a cross for you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And one of the ways that you're encouraged by the Holy Spirit's presence in your life is that you sense that love. And I'm, I'm not a big feelings guy, but I want you to know something. I, I prayed that you would feel the love of God in your life. But if you don't feel it, the truth is he loves you because it's written here in the truth of the capital T. So it doesn't matter whether you feel it or not. The truth is he loves you. But you know what? I want you and my family members to live your life and your walk with the Lord in such a way that you really do feel it. But you go, wow, I'm in such great harmony with the Holy Spirit in my life that I actually feel his love. Because he loves you. Ah, oh, pastor, you don't know what I did last night. Doesn't matter what you did last night. And I know people don't like it, you know, when I talk about sin, I get it. But you know what, I understand you're gonna blow it. I'm a realist, I understand you're gonna blow it. This side of glory, you're gonna blow it. We're gonna talk a lot about that next week. Peter said, be careful. There's a roaring lion out there ready to devour you. Paul tells us that we have to be careful that our war is not against each other, but it's a, it's a spiritual war going on. Yes, I know you know Christ as your Savior. Yes, you're a saint of God. Yes, God has poured out his grace on your life and he loves you deeply, but you're still stuck with this. And I know at times it gets the better of you, but here's the deal. He loves you anyway. Even if this gets the better of you, he loves you anyway. His love is not a conditional love. It's unconditional. He just loves you. And that's what ought to motivate us to walk deeper with the Holy Spirit so that we are able to conquer our flesh, which at times is pretty strong. And number four, 
The Holy Spirit encourages you by assuring you that God is your Father. In Romans chapter eight, it says, you received the spirit of sonship. You got the Holy Spirit in you. And by him, by the Holy Spirit's power and presence in your life, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. If you're not encouraged by the fact that you're able to get on your knees before God and talk, oh, Father, just, Father, I just need to talk to you. This is going haywire in my life. This is not going well. Hey, I, I, Father, I just need to talk to you about someone I love deeply and this isn't going well in their life. Hey, Father, I just want to talk to you and tell you, man, I'm just so grateful for you and what you've done in my children's lives or my life or my marriage or my business or whatever it is. Wow. The only reason why you are able to go to him as Abba Father is simply because of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. And that, sir, ought to be encouraging. You know, we have God the, the Father, we have God the Son, and we have God the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 14, John chapter 16, we, we, we see this beautiful idea, truth of, 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 of the Trinity, how they're all separate and yet they're all one. It's really, really beautiful, really beautiful. My prayer has been that somehow we as a church family would have a, a, a greater, a, a deeper understanding of the truth of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And what a, what a weighty, weighty thing that is for us. Churches like ours, sometimes we get afraid of the Holy Spirit, you know, we don't want to talk about him and we... We're always dancing around some of the things that go on with the Holy Spirit, but I want you to know something. There's a lot in the Word of God about the Holy Spirit's role in our lives. Yes, I think some have gooped it up, but don't let that frighten you to know the truth about the power of the Holy Spirit in in your life. Why don't you stand here over in the venue? Why don't you stand, okay? And so, Father, thank you, Lord, for... um, Oh, everything that's gone on here so far this weekend, uh, this piece of land last night was used in some great ways. We had a gathering in here and people were worshiping you and man, there was a ton of people over in the venue and just learning about how to have a greater marriage or keep their marriage good and all that. Thank you, Jesus, for this tool. Thank you for how we use it. We're about making disciples here. And last night, this morning, God, we're hard at it. Father, may we as a church family really be aware of the fact that wherever we go, we're never alone, that your Holy Spirit indwells us. Father, I pray these things in your name and all of God's people said, amen. Amen.